Well, thank you all for, for coming back. You will recall when last we left our heroes, uh, we had gone through the story of Abraham uh, from beginning to end, um, and uh, even got him killed and remarried, and all sorts of new kids came along. Um, we didn't uh, talk a little bit about Isaac, because there's not a whole lot to say about Isaac. Isaac is, is somebody who, throughout this whole story, kind of gets passed over. You, he is among, as passive as Abraham is in his relationship with Sarah, Isaac is passive in the whole story. In fact, Isaac does not even get to pick out his own wife. Um, you know, you have that type scene of picking a wife. We've talked about that before in a couple of places where a man leaves his home country and meets a woman at the well, and the woman goes home, and the man follows, and they have a party, and they get married. Isaac doesn't even get to do that. I mean, Isaac has another guy do that, and, and Rebecca comes in. So, I mean, he's so passive, so passive he doesn't even get to pick out his wife. Um, there's really only one story about Isaac it, that is just a story of Isaac, and it's a story that shows he made the same mistakes as his dad. Um, the story when Abraham goes down into Egypt and, and lies about uh, his relationship with Sarah, Isaac does exactly the same thing um, about Rebecca. And so that's it. That's the only story you get that's just about Isaac. Um, Rebecca, just like all the matriarchs, spent some time that was uh, dealing with barrenness. Um, usually it's only remembered of Sarah and Rachel, but there is a verse that says that Rebecca also, so all three of them, uh, dealt with infertility. So let's look at this. Uh, verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebecca conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it's to be this way, why do I live? A question that most pregnant women ask at some time, I think, during their, during their time. Uh, so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, so God answers Rebecca. And this is important, I think, for to understand later in the story, remembering that she got an oracle from the Lord, I think, is, I think that's important. So God says, two nations are in your womb, two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. So that's the only detail she has at this point. But she knows that the elder will serve the younger. That, I, I think the fact that she has that knowledge is important for later on in the story. Because um, Rebecca's been given all sorts of, she's been given a hard time by a lot of folks, and I think maybe unfairly uh, in this kind of story. But anyway, when her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau, which uh, sounds like the word for hairy. So they li literally they named him Harry, uh, only with an I as opposed to two R's. Um, he is the, uh, the forerunner of Edom. Uh, he's considered the father of Edom, which is the Hebrew word for red. Um, by the way, Edom is also the Hebrew word for uh, Adam, and it's also the Hebrew word for humankind. It's all the same word with no vowels. Uh, red, because dirt, you know, has a little reddish hue to it, and Adam, all those are the human beings, all the same word. So he is the father of Edom. Uh, afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping on Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob, which means he was holding on to his heel. Uh, that was a really clever name that he lived up with it. Um, but I should say, just real quick, as I say, Esau was hairy, Edom means red, so that's how that all kind of, that tradition comes together. Jacob, supplanter, manipulator, I love shoestring tackler, it's a football metaphor, I knew that would make Sarah happy, um, because it's a really great translation of, of Jacob. The image of, of I mean, con artist would work as well. The idea of a shoestring tackle is you've got a guy, he's got the football, he's running to the end zone, which is, of course, where he wants to be, nothing but green grass in front of him, and all of a sudden, at the very last minute, some defender di dives, clips his heel, knocks him off balance, and now instead of a touchdown, he gets absolutely nothing. That's what Jacob means, all right? You think you're getting a great deal at the last minute, and you're not getting a great deal. He's completely, he's completely conned you. So this is, this is very much what Jacob means. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. I don't like that translation at all. Um, civilized would be a better way of looking at it. Um, the idea is that Esau is the wild one who likes to hunt and go and, and hang out in the woods, and, and Jacob is, is, and I think civilized is probably the best word. I know it's hard to think of civilized living in tents, but there is... There is absolutely, and I, I don't think there's any way to argue this, absolutely a, a Gilgamesh and Enkidu uh, uh, illusion going on between these two individuals. And I don't know if you know the story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, you know, the old stories. Uh, Gilgamesh, the king, 
civilized, the other Enkidu, the wild man, uh, and very much that character. And they even have their own wrestling match at the end of their story as well. So, so I think there's a whole lot going that they're playing off of those allusions to those stories uh, going through. And that's the image. Jacob is the he's the business guy. He's the one you can know, you can trust. He's the he's the civilized one. He gets it. Um, Esau doesn't care anything about that. Um, but Isaac loves Esau. Uh, because he was fond of game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. <laughs> he loved Esau because he liked to eat. That's just a great... <laughs> how, do you, how do you love yourself? Well, he gives me food, so I'm a big fan of that kid. Uh, he's the one who keeps bringing food. So, um, we move a little bit forward in the story. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom, so that's where you get the red connection there. Uh, Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. That seems a little high, don't you think, for a bowl of soup? Um, but believe it or not, there is actually evidence of this in ancient Near Eastern uh, contracts. There's evidence of uh, older sons selling birthrights to younger kids for various things. One of the, the key examples is a goat. Um, there was a, an older son sold his birthright to his younger brother for a goat. He would, so now legally, the younger child is going to be considered first, firstborn, uh, which means with the rules of primogenitor, Older son gets two-thirds of the estate. All the other kids split the remaining third. Um, so it's just two kids. It's two-thirds and one-third. If it's three kids, it divides off. I've always found it interesting that the children could pass it from one to the other without the father. Yeah, not, not involved in any way. Yeah, they could sell it. Um, what's interesting about that goat story is that there's a, I have to remember the contracts, but there, there's a, a problem because the older brother is angry because the goat died. And so he felt, therefore, the birthright should revert back to him since he had sold his birthright for a goat. So people haven't changed, just so you know. I mean, this, this would have been going, it would have tied up in courts for years as they tried to work out who's, whose birthright was who at that point. Um, Esau says, I'm about to die of what use is a birthright to me, which is a fair point. If he dies, then Jacob would be firstborn. But Jacob says, swear to me first. So he swore to him, sold his birthright to Jacob, then Jacob uh, gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Later on, when Esau's a little upset, he accuses Jacob of tricking him here. I think he's just upset there because I don't see the trick. I mean, there are plenty of things we could accuse Jacob of, of tricking him about, but pretty much the stakes seem to be pretty clear on this one, right? Uh, you give me your birthright, I give you the soup. You give me the birthright, here's the soup. I'm missing the trick. Um, it just Now, Esau's stupid. And maybe that's a lesson, you know, maybe Jacob shouldn't take advantage of stupid people is maybe one of the things we should learn. But um, he's taking control of the situation. He's going to legally, and Esau doesn't care. And any of us reading the story know, of course, if, if Esau likes wandering around and Jacob is the smart, civilized, shrewd person, he needs to be in charge, right? When Isaac dies, Jacob needs to be the one deciding where are we going to take our animals, how many are we going to raise, who's going to marry who, what treaties are we going to form. That's what the patriarch does. And, and so, obviously, we have to have to have someone who's responsible doing that. It's Jacob. It's going to be Jacob who's going to do that, obviously. So, Esau despises his birthright. Questions or anything when you talk about that part? About I get to die. What time of life are they in? He's, he's a young man, and yeah. he's hungry. So, <laughs> it's a little overstated. It is a little smidge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm dying. I'm dying. I missed this. Um, this is, this is, I, I forgot to mention this. He was fond of game. I meant to bring this up. Esau, uh, Isaac loved Esau, and it literally says, because of the food he would bring him in his mouth. That is the literal phrasing of that. And so most people go with this because, you know, it gave Isaac good food to eat. But if you literally want to do it, you do get an image of Esau as running out of the field like a dog with the game in his mouth bringing it back to his father. I mean, he really is portrayed animalistically in this story. Um, and so he, he is given to his primal instincts from the, the introduction of the story to here, I'm about to die. So, yeah, Esau is not portrayed particularly favorably in this story. Yeah. Other, yes, sir? We're not supposed to think that Jacob is unethical at all? I, I don't know if we're supposed to think Jacob's unethical or not at this point. Um, he certainly is taking advantage of his brother. Um, Esau despising his birthright. I mean, the stakes, as I say, the stakes are on the table. And this happens in the ancient Near East at this point. So he's working within cultural understandings. 
I don't know if, if we we're supposed to read this. I don't think we're supposed to read it as unethical. I think the next thing we're supposed to read it as unethical. I don't think this part is. Um, in fact, this might just be all God meant in the story, but maybe not. Let me move forward here. Um, by the way, when Esau was 40, he married a Hittite woman, which, you know, you can't control your kids marrying, and sometimes it's, it's not the greatest thing. And, and I love that it made life bitter for Isaac and Rebecca, this, this whole the in-law situation. is Again, people haven't changed, just so you know. That's the one thing I've learned is reading the Bible. The longer run, people have always been people. It's one of the axioms I have in life. All right. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, remember this, uh, that he could not see, he called his elder son Esau and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, See, I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then take your weapons, your quiver, your bow. Go out in the field, hunt game for me, then prepare for me some savory food. I love what the NIV translates it. Tra prepare me some tasty food. Who doesn't like tasty food? Uh, tasty food, some of my favorite. Uh, such as I like, bring it to me to eat, so that I may bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me game, prepare me some savory food to eat, that I may bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my word as I command you. Go to the flock, get me two choice kids, that I may prepare that from, from them savory food for your father, such as he likes. And you shall take it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. Now, real quick, I have heard so many sermons on Rebecca giving her grief for this. I, I've, I've heard her portrayed as manipulative and cunning and sneaky and all this. And look, she's incredibly clever. I'm giving her that. But if you remember at the beginning of this story, God told her the older will serve the younger. And now she's about to see her husband bless the older one. And I think she perceives this as God's what God told her is under attack, and she's going to need to step up to keep Isaac from compromising the will of God. I, I honestly think Rebecca here is acting in what she considers the best interests of the promise that God has given her. I, I give Rebecca the benefit of the doubt in this story. I really do. Um, she's also obviously incredibly clever. We're going to see just how clever she is in just a minute, but, but I really do. I, I tend to read her very because God spoke to her and told her, and now she's witnessing this happen. She's acting, I think, to, to fix that story. So not, not a lot of people read it that way, I will confess. But uh, a couple of the interpreters that I've heard recently I like, I, you know what? They've convinced me on this. I think she is acting. What's the relationship of the blessing to the birthright, if any? What's it? The, there's not really any other than... What does the blessing mean, man? The blessing is the father uh, offering, uh, invoking God to... Uh, I don't want to say it's magical, but it almost is. Invoking God's favor onto one of the children and, and allowing that to... As opposed to the others. Right. The birthright is the legal situation, but, but the blessing is in, invoking God to, <coughs> I mean, to, okay. to provide and lift up one over another. The blessing also is unique to an individual. Mm -hmm. You can't spread it among the mm -hmm. sons, I think. Mm -hmm. No. No, and once you have invoked, once you have spoken it and you've put God in it, that you can't, I mean, that's like signing a contract. You can't take that back. Um, so, I mean, we, we tend to think of, did you sign anything? For them, it's, well, did you mention God in the promise? Oh, well, that's nothing that's to what, do about it then. That's what Jacob asked Esau to do before he Right, asked swear to me. Swear, on. swear to me, right. So that I got this. And now it's mine. You can't take, no take backs. Yeah, <laughs> God has been invoked in this. But Jacob knows tricking his father, this is a problem. I mean, this is the kind of thing later on that's going get to you, get you in big trouble. Uh, Jacob said to his mother, Rebekah, look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a man of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. And I, again, I think because she thinks she's acting in God, for God here. Only obey my word. Go get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared savory food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put the skins of the kids, the goats, on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. What kind of a guy does Esau look like if this is going to fool Isaac here? I mean, this is an attractive man, I think, you know, with, with goat skins we have going on here. Um, da -da -da -da. She handed the savory food and the bread that she had prepared to her son Jacob. And then we get the encounter. This is fascinating to me. So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it you found it so quickly, my son? Look what he says. 
He answered, because the Lord, your God, granted me success. I always thought the way he phrased that was fascinating. Not the Lord, my God, not the Lord, our God, but the Lord, your God, gave me success. There's no ownership of, of Yahweh for him at this point, um, which is so chill. Guy. Anyway, Isaac said to Jacob, come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went up to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Does he believe this? I don't know. I mean, the Bible says that he didn't recognize him, but he sure seems suspicious uh, in this, in this story. Uh, he said, bring it to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it to him, and he ate, brought him wine, he drank, and Father Isaac said, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him and smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field the Lord has blessed. You know, I've smelled a field the Lord has blessed. So we're looking at a guy with goat hairy skin who smells like an open field. Um, hard to believe he was, well, he's not single at this point, so hard to believe he could find a wife. Um, may God give you of the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you. Nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and be blessed by everyone who blesses you. So God has been invoked now. This is now, you know, you can't take it back. This is unrevocable. Um, and so, Jacob leaves. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his father Isaac, his brother Esau came in from his hunting. So he had some pretty good success, too. Uh, he, prepared, he also prepared savory food and brought it to his father. He said, let my father sit up and eat of his son's game so that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I'm your first son, born son of Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me and I ate it before you? came and I blessed him. Yes, and blessed he shall be. When Esau heard his words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said, Bless me also, father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. Well, once. I, I, I'm not, he's upset, so I'll give it to him. But he took away my birthright and he sold me birthright. And look, now he's taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered, I've already made him your Lord and given him all his brothers as servants, and with grain and wine I've sustained him. What can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, father? Bless me, me also, father. And these are all very uh, uh, imperative phrases in Hebrew. These are reinforced. These are, you know, trying to drive it home. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then his father Isaac answered him, See, away from the fatness of the earth you shall your home be, away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, you shall serve your brother. But when you break loose, you shall break his yoke from your neck. So that's not too great a blessing. Your life is going to suck, but eventually you'll be okay. Um, about all he could do. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. So Isaac says he's going to die soon, and so he figures as soon as his dad dies, he takes the period of mourning, then he can kill Jacob, and, and all will be well. But once again, the words of the elder son Esau were told to Rebekah, so she's heard again. Now, God's promise, once again, under threat, right, that God has told him. So she calls her younger son Jacob and says, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, <laughs> obey my voice. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away. Until your brother's anger against you turns away, he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send, bring you back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? But here's the best part of the story to me. She has the plan. Go to my brother Laban. Head up to Haran. I'll call you when things are fine. Then she goes to Isaac. Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm weary of my life because these Hittite women, the ones that Esau married, right, the in-laws that we've got, if Jacob marries one of these Hittite women, such as these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be? I'm not, I'm not going to be able to take it if Jacob marries one of these Hittite women. And Isaac goes, well, you know, we've got to find a way to keep him from doing that. So Isaac calls Jacob and says, don't marry one of these Canaanite women. Go at once to Padamaran to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as a wife from these one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So Isaac came up with the idea, but Rebekah maneuvered him into that, getting to that point there. Did you see that? I mean, she told Jacob, you're going to go to my brother, stay there for a little while. Then she goes to Isaac and says, you know, he marries a Hittite woman. I don't know what I'm going to do. She says, well, I'm going to marry a Hittite woman. We're going to send him up to your brothers. That's what we'll do. Um, 
really nice move by Rebecca here. I mean, she is in complete control of this situation. Again, trying to ensure the promise of God is going to come back, I think. Um, so he goes on up to his brother's house. Um, I'm sorry, I get to talking. I'm not even ask you for questions. How you doing? Questions, clarifications? I get all excited. <laughs> you know. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> I get wound up. <laughs> We're all right? We're good? All right. As we're getting to some of my favorite stuff, parts of this whole story. I mean, these are all good, but my favorites are coming. I think most of these people will interrupt you if they have. I, there are a lot of strong personalities here that have no problems doing that, but I want to make sure and pause if we need that, need that to happen. Um, well, by the way, Esau uh, saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Potamaram to take a wife from there. And blessed him and said, you shall not marry the Canaanite woman. So then he goes and marries another Canaanite woman on top of that because he was angry at his parents. Uh, so, you know, kids, you know, he's going to marry somebody else. That'll show him. Um, but this is where I want to pick up. Verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place, stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am Yahweh, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad, abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place? There's none other than the house of God that David had him. House of God, Bethel, which is what he ends up naming this place. So he lays down, has this intense sleep, has this dream of heaven and earth bridged uh, by this ladder and, and connected, and God is standing there and identifies, you know, I was God of Abraham, I was God of Isaac, and then goes on to say, and I'll be yours too. And I love this moment because at this point, Jacob has to be feeling like, well, I just screwed everything up, right? I mean, the, the stories of his grandfather Abraham, the stories of faith that he showed, leaving Ur of the Chaldees, giving Isaac, and now leaving the land that he has been promised, the family has been promised, that you know the stories have been told. He's got to think, well, I'm the one, I'm the one that screwed up the promise. You know, I'm it. And and there were regional understandings of deity. There were, you know, the gods of Egypt, the gods of Canaan, the gods of the Chaldees, the gods of these are the notion, that's why he says, I didn't know God was here, and I didn't know it. He thought he could actually leave the territory that Yahweh was responsible for. So he's got to think, well, that's it. I'm on my way out. That's how I screwed everything up. And God comes and takes a, a moment to make a point to go, look, the God of your grandfather, the God of your father, I'll be yours too. I'll bring you back. We're not, you're not done yet. I mean, this, this moment of comfort that God comes and speaks here and says, the plan is, we're still rolling with this, all right? We're not out yet. I just, it's just an amazing act of grace by God in this story uh, that, that always encourages me when I, when I, when I read it. Yes? Um, you may have covered this already, but why are there two names for God in this passage, Yahweh and El? Uh, the Yahweh and the God of Abraham? No, and Bethel. Oh, Bethel and the, and the house of God, the gate of heaven? Isn't, isn't Bethel house of God? It is house of God. Mm -hmm. But we're using El here too, El of Abraham. Oh, the L is up there also. Mm -hmm. And the L of Isaac and uh, Yahweh, house of L. Yeah, L and Yahweh. It, it's actually less common Yahweh is used for the, when the patriarch narratives are here. This is an unusual passage, so it's probably a little bit later passage. But uh, yeah, it's, those are used almost interchangeably. El Elyon is pretty common for the patriarchs um, to know him as. So, yeah. The tremendous parallel between the Abraham promise about offspring and mm -hmm. blessing. And it's that that I just find it as a reassuring moment, right? You know, he's got to be thinking he's on his way out and God gives him exactly the same promise he gave to Abraham. We're still in this plan. You know, you're not, you haven't lost yet. We're not out of it yet. But the reactions are different. Jacob is, Jacob is my favorite scoundrel in the whole Bible. He really is, because he just is a scoundrel in this story. Um, Abraham, God says, go to the land I will show you, right? And Abraham goes. Uh, he picks up. <laughs> God comes to Jacob and says, hey, I'm with you. Wherever you go, I'll bring you back to this place. And how does Jacob respond? I love this response. 
Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he put under his head, set it up for a pillar, poured oil on top of it, called the place Bethel. The name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I set up for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you give me, I'll give a tenth to you. Cut through. Only if all this other stuff. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Like God's going to go, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so, so Abraham picks up and goes, and Jacob says, all right, I have some terms. Um, if you keep me safe, and you give me food, and you give me clothes, and you bring me back in peace, then you can have a tenth, and I will name this place after you. <laughs> it's cute. Thank you. Jacob is always trying to stay in control of the situation. Jacob wants to make sure that he's got the, I mean, buying the birthright, even the blessing, that's Rebecca, but still. And here, even with God, I'm going to be in control of the situation. So, have to do this. so um, well, I'm going to have to move a little forward in the story because we're going to jump a little bit. You probably know the story. He's on his way up. He's on his way there. He falls in love with a woman. He leaves his home country, goes to a well, sees a girl. At this point, anybody who's reading it from the ancient world knows, well, here's where he finds his wife. He sees Rachel. He picks the stone up off the well himself. So he's got some skills, too. I mean, Esau was the hunter, but Jacob's no slouch. He picked the stone off to water the animals, kisses Rachel, a little forward, um, but, you know, does it anyway. Goes, goes back, Rachel goes back, goes to Laban, um, and hires himself out to his uncle. And Laban says... Because you're my kinsman, what, should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were, interesting translation, lovely. And Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Um, literally, it says that Rachel, or excuse me, Leah was weak of the eye. And that word weak can mean lovely. It can also imply that her eyes are blue, because that would be a, a weaker color. Uh, in a Semitic culture. It could also imply that her vision was poor, um, or it could imply she was weak on the eye, if you will, um, and not at all attractive. Um, lovely is, I think, a fair way to go uh, here, um, just because I hate picking on Leah. I just don't. I, just don't, I have no real textual basis, because all of those are equally interpreted uh, fair. I just, I like, I like lovely better. Anyway, Leah's eyes were lovely. And Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said what any father-in-law would say. It's better I give her to you than I give her to anybody else. So that's touching, isn't it? It's just beautiful, that kind of love that you see in the in-laws there. Um, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. <laughs> just so beautiful. <laughs> the touching love story that we get here. Um, and now we see uh, he's also a silver tongue devil here. Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her. Well, that's beautiful, isn't it? That's just, uh, it's been a long seven years. Uh, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place, made a feast, but in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. That's important later on. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, This is not done in our country. Give it the younger before the firstborn. Complete this week with this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed a week. Then Laban gave his daughter Rachel as a wife. In other words, as soon as his honeymoon was over, there was another marriage. A week later, uh, he got the woman on the front end of this seven years uh, at this point. So... You know, I never realized that. I was thinking that he waited. No, nope, no, nope. it was right as soon as the honeymoon was over. Okay. Yeah, he, uh, it's a seven week, the, the next weekend, they, they scheduled, they still had, I guess they had the, the stuff, the settings and the candelabra. Yeah, so it's cheaper to do it now instead of waiting seven years. Yeah. Almost so, something like Esau got to Laban. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Well, that's one way to look at it. I always look at it that Jacob gets his personality from his mom's side of the family, oh. is the way I tend to read it. Because um, there's a lot of guile going on in this story. Um, a lot of trickery. Um, one of my favorite interpretations of this passage is not in the Bible, but it is in the Talmud. And this is, I always tell the students, this is one of those times that it's not in the Bible, but I think for me it kind of is in the Bible. Uh, because the story goes in the Talmud that the next morning they wake up and uh, Jacob realizes that he's married Leah. And he says to Leah, how could you, while we were in the throes of passion, 
say that you were Rachel. And the story goes in the Talmud that Leah looked back at Jacob and said, how could you go to your brother and say that you were Esau? Um, <laughs> so I, I've always liked that interpretation. <laughs> I kind of hold on to that one. Because uh, for one thing, it makes Leah kind of tough. But also, uh, I think there's something to that uh, in this. But of course, Leah is, is in many ways a pawn in this story. She's going to do what her father says. She, she doesn't get her own choices um, in, in all of this. Um, so Jacob, uh, the, Jacob went to Rachel also. He loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. Jacob loved Rachel, but uh, God loved Leah. Uh, and we see that is sort of God's way. He is always on the side of those that aren't chosen or favored. He's always on the side of the outcast. Um, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, and Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben, for she said, because my... Uh, the Lord has looked on my affliction. Surely now my husband will love me, uh, which is just, boy, that one hurts. You know, I've given my husband a son. Maybe now he will love me. It's tough. She conceived again and bore a son. His Lord has heard that I am hated. He has given me this son also, named him Simeon. She conceived and bore a son and said, now the time, now this time my husband will be joined me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore she named him Levi. She conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Um, so God gave her these three. I told you that uh, Jacob loved Rachel, but God loved Leah. Um, the line of David, the line of Jesus comes through Leah uh, in this story. So um, Jacob did what he could to build a great nation all on his own. Um, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah are born, and Rachel is tired of not having kids. And so Rachel tells Bilhah, her handmaid, to go sleep with Jacob. And that way the child can pass through her knees and they can, uh, she can give her husband uh, children. So Dan and Naphtali are born there. Uh, Leah said, oh yeah, well, I've got a handmaid too. And she gives Zilpah to Jacob, who then bears Asher and Gad. But then it turns out that she wasn't quite done bearing because she bore Zebulun, Issachar, and the only girl of the group, Dinah, um, before ultimately Rachel did give birth to Joseph and she dies in childbirth with Benjamin. So there is, are, the, are your 12 tribes. However, I'm oh, sorry, you got a question there? No, the 12 are well, on the screen? Close, yes. Okay. Except Joseph's two kids each get tribes of their own. Joseph has two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim and Manasseh are tribes of Joseph. So there's really sort of 14 tribes. Uh, except there's sort of 13 because Joseph doesn't get land, Ephraim and Manasseh get land. But... Levi doesn't get land because he's the priestly tribe, so there's really just sort of 12, even though there's sort of 15, 14. <laughs> it's math. It's Bible math. You know? I like to point all of the... <laughs> Dinah doesn't matter. Dinah doesn't get counted. She's a woman. Sorry. She's a woman. Yeah, yeah, that's... So I can't help you with that. Favored. Which one was favored? Judah and Joseph's tribes are the favored tribes. No, I said, wasn't Benjamin the favorite of... Benjamin... Favorite child... Benjamin was the favorite after Joseph gets uh, the Isthotsi's dead, but Joseph is the favorite. Um, and the two northern tribes, the major northern tribes that when the country splits are really responsible for having the capital and commerce and all that, are Joseph's tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. But it's always interesting to me whenever anyone lists the 12 tribes of Israel, which 12 tribes they list. Because you got 14 names to choose from. And so anytime you list 12, somebody's getting left out. So, for example, in Revelation, Joseph and Ephraim are listed, but no Manasseh. Um, and one other is left out in, in Revelation also. So, you know, I, whenever people start getting sort of militant about their interpretations of numbers in the Bible, I like to point this out. Really, how many tribes are there then? 12? Yeah, okay, which 12? Because uh, we got 14 here. Um, that we got going. So, but like I said, he's trying to build a great nation all on his own. Well, how come Joseph's was split? Um, he had two sons, and there's an honor in that. But his two sons each get an inheritance of land on their own. Nobody else has his sons. Nobody else. Well, nobody else's sons get honored in that way. Yeah. Yes. Um, is is polygamy throughout the whole Old Testament? Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a wealth. It's a status thing. Um, look at the number of women I can support, look at the wealth I have. Uh, so the more wives you have, it's a statement of power and, and wealth. And, and look how many kids I can have. And look how many kids I can have. I mean, these are all property. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a property statement. 
it, wealth, women, children are all property issues for them. When, when did the Jews adopt monotheism? I mean, not monotheism. Mon monogamy. monogamy. Yeah. Monogamy. Um, it, there is some indication that even in the first century there was some polygamy going on, which I think is why Paul says that deacons are going to need to be husbands of one wife. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not long uh, after the first century. Yeah. So there was still polygamy when Jesus was alive? I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think it's changing, but, yeah, I think so. I think that's an interesting stream for me because I don't think I thought about the handmaidens I, of the 12 tribes yep. either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they count too. So, I mean, it's just the story of this. Like, I mean, Leah has to buy time with Ra buy time with Jacob with Rachel. So like she has, I think Reuben goes out and picks um, mandrakes, which were supposed to be aphrodisiacs, and, and to help Rachel conceive, to give Rachel the mandrakes to buy a night with Jacob, which of course she gets pregnant with. I mean, she can't pass Jacob in the hall without getting pregnant, apparently. <laughs> um, so just, you know, one night's all she needed with the mandrakes uh, on that. So yeah, it's just boy sisters. And this is one of those examples. He's married sisters and his first cousins here. Both of those things are forbidden by later Torah. And so one of the things that for me gives a historicity to these stories is the fact that these individuals aren't supermen who are obeying the Torah. You know, you would expect if you're making up a story that your ancestors are going to be superheroes that are going to follow all of your rules. These guys don't. I mean, this is a, they, they are flawed human beings that has, there's a quality of honesty to me in the storytelling here that I just, I really enjoy. So, um, After he works for 14 years, uh, Laban suddenly realized this Jacob knows what he's doing. Things are, I mean, he's, he's a business guy. He, he's, got, he's got some gifts. And so he talks him into working for another six years. Uh, Jacob did some clever genetic uh, experiments to increase his own flocks uh, in that time um, based on some what we would consider flawed reasoning, but it turned out to work okay for him. Um, and he ends up increasing his flocks greater than Laban's, but he realizes he's never going to be able to leave, so he finally decides to leave. He's got to get back home, and so he sneaks out uh, by night. He and his wives and kids, all 11 of them at that point, uh, and um, Laban comes after him. Laban comes after him partly because he didn't get to say goodbye to his daughters, and partly because, unbeknownst to Jacob, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Um, the household gods were probably um, important for business and contracts and that kind of thing. They might have been like a notary seal or something like that in the time. And so Laban has just lost his, you know, lost, lost his notary seal. So he goes to, he says, you didn't give me a chance to say goodbye to my daughters. And by the way, where's my household gods? Um, and Jacob's like, I don't have your household gods. Search the camp, you know, go ahead. <laughs> Which point Rachel's like, oh my gosh, I got the household gods. So Rachel put them in a bag and sat on the bag. And when the men came in to look, they said, would you get up in the bag? She goes, well, I would get up but I'm on my period. And they're like, you know what? You can stay right there. That's your bag now. And, uh, and they didn't search the bag. So, I mean, you see why Jacob and Rachel get along. I mean, they've got the same personality. I mean, they, they really, it makes total sense. But he goes on his way back, and he hears that Esau's coming, and Esau's got an army with him, a big army with him. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob. So in other words, say to my lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob. He's already putting Esau in a position of power here. And I'm just like, I've lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves. I have sent to tell my lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. In other words, I'm sending you these presents. Please don't kill me. All right, that's, that's what's happening. The messengers return to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he's coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. This is, this is not a good sign, right? This is, this is bad. So Jacob was greatly afraid of distress. He divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies, thinking if Esau comes, the one company destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. Again, staying in control of this entire situation. Wait till you see what he does later on. This is hysterical. Jacob said, oh, he goes on to say, Sends the women on across the ford. He's by himself in the ford of the Jabbok. That same night, he got up, took his two wives, his two maids, his eleven children, crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them, sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. Verse 24, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. The number of times I have heard this passage preached, wrestling with God, um, I couldn't even count on one hand. And yet, the biblical text says, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. It doesn't say an angel. doesn't say God. 
It says a man, ish in Hebrew, a man wrestled. I just like to point out the text every now and then. You know, we bring so many of stories and interpretations to the story, we don't realize sometimes the text says it was a dude that he wrestled with there by the river. Um, I always told the students, too, when the man saw he didn't prevail against Jacob, is anyone else concerned that the God of the universe can create the entire universe but can't get out of a full Nelson? Doesn't that bother anyone else in this interpretation? But apparently not. No, it's wrestling with God. Anyway, he struck him on the hip socket. Uh, Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. By the way, I think another uh, connection to the Gilgamesh Enkidu story um, where, and now I can't remember which one does which to the other, but one of them hits the knee of the other to win the wrestling match between the two of them. And I can't remember which one did that. Anyway, sorry about that. I'll have to look that up for you. But uh, the man said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Always staying in control, right? Always staying in control. <coughs> so the man said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Basically, remember, names give insight into character. When he says, what is your name? He is asking him, who are you? And he says, I'm the con artist. I'm the manipulator. I'm the supplanter, I'm the shoestring tackler, I'm the guy who's, I mean, I'm the trickster. That's who I am. And the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and humans and have prevailed. This is what, in psychological terms, is known as reframing, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is taking the negative and making it positive, all right? You aren't the, the trickster, you're, you're, the, the, you're a tough one. That's what you are. You are. You, I, when, I always tell the story when we were raising the kids, Daniel was easier to discipline than Thomas. Daniel, I could explain to him, you know, look, if you do that, you're going to go have to sit on the sad chair. Uh, or if you don't eat your vegetables, you're going to have to go sit on your bed. And Daniel, oh, I need to eat those vegetables, right? With Thomas, it was, if you don't eat your vegetables, you're going to have to go sit on your bed. And Thomas gets up from the table and goes to his bed. Um, like, no, wait, no, Ken, no. That's, I was bluffing. That was not... That was not real. Thomas was like that. Thomas was like, what is the cost of doing business? I will figure it in to give me I can do whatever the heck I want. That's what I need to know. I mean, if he would have had a way to verbalize, you know, if I would have said, if you do that, I'm going to spank you, he would have said, well, you're just going to have to spank me then because that's what's going to happen. I'm going to do this, and this is, this is what's going to happen. Jacob is one who has, he's a tough one. He is just one that doesn't ever make it easy. Abraham does exactly what God says when God says go. Jacob says, all right, I have a list of demands. Jacob says, I'm in control. Jacob, you know what? You, you wrestle with God. That's what you do. Now, what's funny to me about this renaming by this man, it doesn't <laughs> stick, right? The minute God says you will no longer be called Abram, but Abraham, the rest of the story, we call him Abraham, right? No longer will you be called uh, Simon, but Peter, and the rest of the time we call him Peter, Jacob, you should all be called Jacob and Israel for your strip with God and humans and you prevail. Then Jacob asked him, can't even get the name for one verse. It just never sticks. This one, we never think of him as Israel. We always think of him as Jacob. This new name just never sticks. Jacob says, tell me your name because i got to stay in control too. But he said, why do you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel for saying, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Peniel means face of God. So being in this place was like seeing the face of God for him. It's, it's forcing him to wrestle with all of that in his whole life. For some, that's where this wrestling with God thing comes from, is that, that it's called Peniel is this. But I have an alternative suggestion for who is the identity of the man wrestling by the Javik River here, and it comes in the next chapter. Because Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him, so he divided his children. Check this line up. Divide his children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He lined them up in the order he loved them the most to go and encounter Esau. This, this is a classy guy we got going here, isn't it? I mean, can't you see that lineup? No, you know what? You guys switch places. You, just, yeah, you keep going. On up to the front. You're, you're my guy. That's right. <laughs> just, ah. Anyway, he himself went on ahead. There's at least that. And he bowed against the ground seven times until he came near his brother. So he's leading the way, trying to, you know, apologize to his brother. Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. Finally, Rachel came to him and bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough. My brother, keep what you have for yourself. I think it's significant that even though Esau isn't 
Chosen, he's provided for. Once again, the not chosen one does pretty well. God doesn't reject them. Jacob said, no, please, if I find favor with you, accept my present from my hand, for truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God. In the next chapter, I tend to think, the Bible is winking at us here, I tend to think that man by the Jabbok River was Esau. I tend to think after 20 years, the boys finally had it out, one after another, and Esau finally forgave him, offering him that new name, there by the river. Um, if nothing else, seeing Esau now is exactly like that moment by the river. I mean, that's the very minimum of the interpretation here. But I really do think that uh, it is Jacob uh, and Esau wrestling by the river Jabbok. I do. I, I, I believe that. Uh, you don't have to, but I do. <laughs> so, so anyway. Um, real quick, before anybody uh, asks about name changing, the next chapter, God changes his name. God appeared to Jacob again uh, when he came from Padam Aram and blessed him. And God said, your name is Jacob. No longer should be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. It doesn't take here either. Um, called him Israel. God said, I'm God Almighty. And then it's like the next paragraph. He's called Jacob again. So never really sticks. Um, family two, we saw it last week. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah. Leah wins in death. Uh, in death, Leah gets to be Jacob's wife because Rachel died in childbirth with Benjamin and was buried by Bethlehem. So, so she wins there. So that's our run through the life of Jacob. Uh, what do you have to say? Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts? You go ahead. You went by it, but uh, the significance of the hip and the socket mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, is, is quite significant in the Jewish. Yeah, yeah, that it's provided a, uh, an etiology for why that part of the animal isn't eaten. Yeah. And, and how does that fit with your belief about Esau? I don't know that I connected. I don't think it affects the reading. Okay. Um, I don't think so. Um, no, I, it happened I mean, at the same time. It did, it did, and that's how he wins, the art is, is he wrenches the hip out of socket. But, um, yeah, I don't think it's a, I don't think it hurts my reading. Yeah, just checking. I appreciate that. Keep me on my toes, Ron. Absolutely. Yeah, see? Um, Twelve kids, one of them is a girl, mm -hmm. Dinah. Maybe she gets her own tribe. Mm -hmm. In a way, yeah. She gets, well, she's, of course, raped, and the boys have to take vengeance upon her uh, in the story. Um, it's, a, it's a brutal story. So I, I do read some of the brutal stories, but that one I tend to skip over. Although that is kind of a funny story uh, after the brutality, uh, because when the boys get their vengeance, um, the people that raped her said, we'd like to take her as a wife. And, and the boys said, well, you know, we can't marry her to Canaanites. That I'll tell you what, if the whole town circumcises itself, then we'll let, let her marry you. And the guy's like, okay, that's fine. So the whole town circumcised themselves. And while they were still sore, the boys attacked the town and destroyed everybody um, after they were sore from the circumcision. So... I don't preach on that text very often. Um, <laughs> I don't. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't. I don't. That one doesn't work for me. So. Yeah. See, it's quite detailed. Uh, there's at the beginning you feel like there's stuff that does not provide. Uh, I'm struck by your remark about the historicity of mm. uh, the, the yeah. very existing and sort of uh, when it includes information right. that's not favorable. Right. Um, I think here in the end, my big takeaway is, and it was no surprise, is this was a story written by and for people for whom genealogy was really extremely important. important. They yeah. were trying to document yeah. the history of their mm -hmm. nation. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if the God part, the relationship with God, is that's that's the, the if not the mortar, the next, the, the thread that's right. woven through it tapestry itself is one of where we came from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's who we are. It's remembering its identity. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because Israel, when you, when you call him Israel, it's all of a sudden so much easier to hear that, I think. When you call Jacob, you can kind of miss it. But, uh, but that identification of Israel and dividing, I, I passed over it pretty quick too, he dividing it into two companies well, of course, Israel divides into two nations, and you know, and I'm sure that there's an, a, a, a subtle allusion to that there as well. I mean, I think there are elements of the story later on, um, absolutely. Uh, but it's identity. You're right, absolutely. It's genealogy and identity, who we are, where we come from. Yeah. Yeah, Steve. Um, you mentioned.
mentioned the epic of Gilgamesh and its influence on the stories. In some sense, aren't some of the stories just taken from the epic of Gilgamesh and recast? I don't think so. I mean, I, I see the, um, I mean, certainly creation narrative, flood narrative, yes. But I think they are taken and theologically corrected, for lack of a better thought, of the how, how, you know, when you think of the flood, think of it this way. When you think of creation, think of it this way. In the case of the patriarchs, I think that there are, I think they're, I don't know, homage, rhyme, tropes, but I don't think it's, I don't think they're simply recasting the story. I mean, I think when we read one is hairy and wild and one is civilized, it's hard for us not to think Gilgamesh and Enkidu if you're an ancient reader of this text. But their stories don't follow that, that same path. It's just, I think there's something, something about those stories that would resonate in the reading of it, the wrestling match and, and the characterization of them. I think it's casting Jacob as the worthy one and Esau as not the worthy one. Are there any bed tricks in Gilgamesh? Uh, like the bed trick of, you know, the substituted? I don't think so. No, I mean, he, he does get Enkidu uh, with the prostitute for what, seven days to wear him out, but that's not a trick. Um, he just sends it to Enkidu. Yeah. Ancient Near Eastern stories are interesting. Um, I don't preach on those much either. <laughs> Other thoughts? I love Jacob. I mean, if ever, you know, God doing the best he could with what he had. I mean, this is <laughs> this is a not a, not quite as bad as judges, but still pretty. I mean, he's pretty scoundrel here. I mean, the first thing he does after he meets Jacob, this wonderful or Esau, this wonderful reunion, hug, love. Esau goes, "Oh, you have to come back and spend some time with me." Yeah, you know what? We'll catch up. We're slow. We're slow. You go ahead. We'll meet you. And as soon as he leaves, Jacob goes the other direction. <laughs> so, I mean, he can't old habits, right? Oh, one other thing. Do you remember why Isaac was wanting to bless Esau when that happened? Do you remember why it was that was motivating the need for the blessing? He was going to die, right. 20 years later, he's with Esau. Um, so just so you know, when your dad tries to kill you as a child, make sure you hypochondriac. That's one thing I think we've proven from the Bible here, uh, that he, 20 years later, he's still alive, um, even though he thought he was going to die, which is what motivated all that. The Jewish couple of fathers are Yeah, it seems, seems somewhat, um, not to follow the stereotypes, but yeah. <laughs> I found it interesting how significant the women were in the roles yes. throughout this whole uh, discussion tonight. Yeah, I, 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 that's why I like to talk about ancestors rather than patriarchs. You know, uh, books that were published, you know, when, when you were taking the Old Testament, this chapter was the patriarchs. Mm. But I think the women play such an important role in this yeah. story all the way through. Yeah. And... Uh, I mean, whether it's Sarah and Hagar and, and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah, I, yeah, I, and they are not mentioned outside of Genesis. And you don't. God speaking to Rebecca, I don't think I. An know. oracle to Rebecca. I, I don't yeah. think I recall anybody talking about that very much or remembering it from my own reading. Yeah. So it's. I mean, the women are the women are important. Women are key, and I like to I like to highlight that. And again, not mentioned outside of the Bible or outside of, of here. I mean, Rachel is mentioned as sort of a typology. She's weeping for her children when Jerusalem dies. But uh, you don't get a lot of mention of the women. And in the New Testament, you know, Sarah is the mother of the Jews and Hagar is, you know, but but you only as sort of types. You don't ever get their stories mentioned like you do in other places. Actually, in many of the patriarchs, you don't get a lot of that either. So. All right. Well, thank you for your good attention and your good attendance. Um, we will finish this up with Joseph uh, and his narrative uh, and then we will, then it's Christmas. So, because next week is today, and then I think we've got one, one week of Joseph, and then we've got the carols sing and, and dinner. And so, yeah, great. I hope you've enjoyed our sprint through the book of Genesis this fall. So, <laughs> have a great night. Thank you.
Philadelphia. Oh, Philadelphia, yes. Uh, you remember. Yeah, that's so short. Oh, that's so short. <laughs> 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 oh, that's so short. Oh, that's so short. Oh, that's so short. Oh, that's so short. O